Good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, Art in the Spotlight. Um, I'd like to begin, uh, first of all, with a, um, our land in acknowledgement. Uh, this land is the territory of the Anishinaabe Mississauga Nation and was also the territory of the Huron-Wendat, Neutral, and Seneca Nations. So welcome. And hi, Michelle. Hi, Julie. How are you? I'm good, I'm good. good. Thanks for agreeing to have this conversation with me. Absolutely. Um, and uh, I feel almost before we start that we have to sort of just do a full disclosure about our relationship. I mm -hmm. feel like we, we are connected in so many ways. Mm -hmm. um, we're not just talking as colleagues, but I think also as, as friends. Um, and uh, yeah, and it's, it's nice to, to share this space with you. Always, Michelle, you've been a, a great supporter and uh, continue to be. And um, it's great to have these kinds of uh, conversations that kind of draw on our passions and interests um, and a kind of select knowledge. Um, so I'm, I'm thrilled that you asked me to participate. So for those who don't know, uh, my name is Michelle Preston clark I'm a visual artist based here in Toronto, um, but I'm also currently serving a three-year term as the photo laureate for the city of Toronto. Um, and in that role, I am an advocate and an ambassador for photography and visual arts in the city. So I think a lot about photographs and representation um, and what uh, the role that visual culture plays um, in what we think about what we understand about each other here in the city of Toronto. Um, and so I wanted to have this conversation about the Montgomery Collection, I think for, for a couple of reasons. Um, obviously we all know we've been going through uh, an intense few months um, and we are seeing in the last few weeks um, discussions of anti-Black racism in Canada that uh, in, my, in my view are uh, unprecedented in terms of the, the scale and scope um, of what is being uh, brought up, what is being addressed, questions that are being asked. Um, and in terms of thinking about the Black presence in Canada, I don't know how many Canadians are aware um, that, you know, Caribbean people have been in this country since the late 18th century. Um, and Blackness in Canada, I think, is made up of such a multiplicity of Blacknesses because so many of us have come from so many places in so many different ways, but that the Caribbean presence starts with, you know, the Maroons coming from Jamaica to Nova Scotia in the late 18th century. Um, and I guess one of the other reasons is that um, in our sector, we are seeing institutions being interrogated um, and challenged very rightly so for um, the lack of programming, the lack of taking up of these issues. Um, and you know, you've been doing this work for some time and I just felt like it was a good moment to sort of check in on where things are at with this collection because I feel a little bit uneasy about the reactive um, gestures that some people are making right now. And it's, make, it's been making me think about how like in sports, if somebody gets caught out as like doping later on, they get an asterisk placed next to their achievement, you know, as a kind of signal that, well, you know, they won this acclaim, but something else was going on. And I have this sort of tension of feeling like, all the invitations and opportunities that Black people are getting right now have this kind of asterisk attached to it. Um, we always have to question, do we get um, the invitation? Do we get included because of the value of our work or because we check a diversity box? And that feels kind of heightened right now. So all of that is to say, you know, this collection has been work, worked on for some time. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just thought, yeah, I wanted to, to talk a little bit about it. And obviously it's very near and dear to my heart um, because full disclosure as well, I'm one of the 27 uh, donors who helped to purchase this collection for the HEO. Um, and I chose to, to have my donation recognized under my mom's name um, because of her deep love for uh, Caribbean um, art and, uh, and politics as well. So. So uh, I think it's been just over a year, right? Since the acquisition was yeah. announced. Mm -hmm. um, and I think some people know this story, but it's just such a great story. So maybe we could just start with how you came to, how did this collection come to you? Like, how did you come to find out about this collection? 
Um, well, first of all, uh, again, I want to thank you, Michelle, for um, uh, being one of those very generous supporters. Uh, I want to say that, um, again, you know, we feel as if the work isn't being done, but the work is being done, even if in, in a slow and protracted way. Um, the majority of the supporters were Black and Caribbean from this community. And I thought that was um, very important to the, this kind of overall uh, story. Um, it, it means, I think, more in terms of ownership and legacy and access um, that this group of 27 people came forward and said, we understand what this means um, historically, personally, and we want to be part of it. I think that's a, that's a really important um, uh, part of the kind of, you know, uh, entirety of, of the story of acquiring the collection. Um, in terms of the, and it is unprecedented, actually, the collection itself and the ways in which a, a small community came together to acquire yeah. it. Um, and again, a community that um, was not necessarily part of the institution's, you know, kind of um, DNA, you know, in terms of a donor structure, in terms of acquisitions, in terms of uh, exhibitions, in terms of hiring. So structurally, um, you know, uh, as you say, this community has been part of, the Caribbean community has been part of uh, Canadian history since the 19th century, yet um, erased from, you know, these institutional structures um, and communities. So I think politically, it was also important that uh, this was the group front facing that, you know, was really part of, of this project. Um, so uh, how did we come about it? Well, um, Sophie- and Also, just yeah. for folks who don't know, just, just mm -hmm. describe as you're sharing with us, what mm -hmm. is the collection exactly? Right. And, and how did right. you come to, to know about it? Yeah. Right. Um, so in 2018, uh, Sophie Hackett uh, and I, so Sophie is the curator of photography uh, at the AGO, uh, and I were attending a um, photography show uh, called APAD. Um, and while we were there, we were told about uh, this collector, Patrick Montgomery, and this extraordinary uh, collection. Um, we then uh, went to visit Patrick, uh, who happens to live, I hope he doesn't mind me sharing this, um, in Robert Maplethorpe's former loft. <laughs> <laughs> so that added Robert a whole history, layer, yeah. <laughs> oh, I tell you, a whole layer of, you know, history, photography, history, problematic, you know, <laughs> photography, history, and we could have a whole session about that, I'm sure, yeah. conversation. Um, but, uh, we visited, we um, looked at the collection, um, and as he pulled out box after box after box, you know, carefully labeled, um, cataloged, um, I realized that we were witnessing something quite unique uh, and extraordinary. Um, and as he was talking us through the collection, he mentioned that, you know, it was time for him to stop collecting and wanted to find a home uh, for the collection. So we're talking, you know, over 4,000 objects uh, and ephemera. Um, and he wanted it to be, you know, some kind of established institution. Um, so really he could have um, taken it to Brooklyn in his backyard, Brooklyn Museum. Um, it could have gone to the British Museum, uh, you know, in, in places where there are a large demographic in terms of uh, Caribbean uh, uh, folks. Um, but I think we persuaded him um, you know, harassed him actually uh, in, ter in, in, in terms of um, situating this collection at the ADO um, for all of the reasons we've already spoken about. Um, and so there, you know, ensued a series of conversations um, with uh, our chief curator, with the, the director, um, uh, a few folks on the board, including Dr. Ken Montague, who actually went to see the collection after we did. And, you know, we were all in agreement that this is a collection that 
um, would be very, very uh, instrumental in uh, st starting to change literally the complexion of the photography collection uh, at the AGO um, and opening up a conversation uh, and expanding a conversation about the history of photography. Because now you're talking about the history of photography in the Caribbean. Um, and this idea of parallel history. So what is happening in Europe is now is happening in you know Jamaica and Trinidad. And um, so I thought, um, or we thought that this was um, very important uh, to add uh, to the collection to continue this conversation and then to figure out a way how to acquire it. So that's the 27 individuals that came together. Yeah. I know I just I can't imagine what it must like been like to, to see these photographs for the first time, particularly because I think so often when we see images from the past, we see digital, you know, it's like you're you're looking online on sort of archival uh, things that have been have it's expensive to scan. So not even everything is scanned, um, but to actually the materiality of because it's not just photographs, right? It's it's photo books like like what was Albums. that like for you to, to see and touch these things for the first time? Um, I think Sophie will tell you there, for me, there was a visceral response um, to be able to see a daguerreotype, mm -hmm. you know, from um, Martinique, uh, to hold the objects, to turn the objects, you know, verso, uh, to see inscriptions, um, you know, just the variety and types of objects. Uh, so as you say, the materiality, um, because some of them are not in the greatest condition and that's okay because yeah. that reflects, you know, their, their time, you know, on this earth, uh, their uh, fragility. Mm -hmm. um, and it also for me helps to imagine the time in which the uh, photograph was taken, you know, um, and the conditions of the tropics, you know, yeah. not conducive to, um, you know, photo paper and chemicals and, you know, just the breaking down of all of that, um, for me, uh, helped to um, tell all kinds of different stories. Um, apart from the subjects that we are encountering, uh, it's this kind of larger history that, as you say, um, is often relegated to a particular type of understanding or trope about the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. um, and this for me just explodes that and uh, allows for multiple, you know, um, perspectives and histories and experiences and, and stories, um, not only about photography, but about life, uh, you know, after uh, uh, emancipation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, thinking about how uh, Caribbean representation in this city um, is, is very narrow. I mean, mm -hmm. I, both representations of the Caribbean there, you know, I think most people immediately would think beach, you know, palm tree, um, and then the Caribbean presence here, um, which I think most people would just caravana, you know? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So we have uh, very narrow visuals that are circulated about um, our communities and our experiences. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you have these 4,000 objects. What, what, how does that expansion, how does that expand the representation? Like what are the, um, what are the themes? What are the ideas? What, uh, what do we see in this collection? Mm -hmm. Well, apart from the kind of variety of objects, lantern slides, albumin prints, cabinet cards, carte de visites, daguerreotypes, um, postcards, stereographs. So you have this, you know, wide ranging, you know, um, examples of photographic um, methods, approaches, types, et cetera. Um, what is really interesting is exactly as you, you say, um, it isn't this narrow idea or trope that um, the Caribbean itself, uh, kind of archipelago, um, has been fighting. You know, the, the idea of the tropics, the mm -hmm. idyllic nature of this, of this region and its so-called natives, you know, who are uh, basically seen as a servile, right? Um, this 
um, collection offers, I think, reveals um, the scope of experiences post-emancipation, right? And some of those experiences absolutely are, you know, so-called tourist views yeah. um, and are uh, at times relegated to a particular um, trope of, you know, labor, you know, just because yeah. plantation economies are so-called um, done with, uh, there's a continuation of plantation economies with, um, uh, you know, smaller plots of land and newly emancipated um, people working those plots of land, you know, so it's, it, there's still this attachment to the land and labor and um, uh, a kind of colonial domination, right? So, um, but the, what I think this collection offers is a kind of um, deepening of that understanding, you know, through the photographs. Like, what exactly is happening? What is life? What is the afterlife? I guess, as Sadia Hartman um, mm -hmm. thinks about it, the afterlife of slavery in this region. Because we always think about that in relation to the United States, yes. you know, the, the antebellum self. But what is it, what is life like uh, for people on the ground um, in this region post uh, slavery. Uh, and that's what you're seeing play out, you know, the, the kind of market images, the, uh, as again, as I said, uh, labor, um, the migration or forced migration and transportation of uh, the Indo-Caribbean, or now the, first of all, the uh, uh, people from the Indian self subcontinent to the Caribbean to do, uh, to become indentured uh, labor uh, following um, the, you know, the collapse or end of a plantation uh, slavery. Um, so I think these kinds of uh, drastic, upheav the, the upheaval, drastic changes um, post-slavery is what you're seeing in the, in the collection. Um, and I think the collection in a way um, if phot photographs can do this, and I'm sure Tina Camp would argue that they do do this, uh, gives a voice, you know, yeah. gives a voice to um, the subjects and their stories um, that if not, um, if we didn't have this collection, we wouldn't be privy to in a, in a way. You know what I mean? We do come across photographs in history books and Caribbean history books, of course, um, but to have a kind of um, uh, collection, uh, not quite encyclopedic, but in, in one area that mm -hmm. you can engage uh, with these histories in this way, I think really helps to upend, you know, these uh, uh, kind of, you know, enduring tropes of, you know, this is just the Caribbean, both here and there, as you so eloquently, you know, mm -hmm. uh, put in your notes to me, um, that it isn't just about a carnival. Carnival is a, you know, um, offshoot in, in a fabulous way of, you know, um, the, um, you know, kind of vestiges of, of, of slavery and, and enslavement. Um, but there's so much more. And yeah. there's so much more there as well. Yeah. I do, I mean, from the sample I've seen, so um, the, you know, the few events that have been held for the, the, the donor group to be able mm -hmm. to look at a selection of the photographs. I mean, the energy in the room is, is palpable, you know, as people look at these photographs and, uh, you know, I mean, our history books are very limited. So mm -hmm. for most people, it's like, I've never, ever, ever in my life seen an image that looks anything like this, you mm -hmm. know? Um, and because of slavery, you know, um, the conversation around slavery in the Caribbean varies from island to island. It's like, there's, I think one of our colonial legacies is a silence mm -hmm. around, around slavery. Mm -hmm. um, but you definitely have that feeling when you're looking at some of these photographs, you know, am I looking at my ancestor? Mm -hmm. you know? And so that... I mean, I'm getting goosebumps just right now, you mm -hmm. know, thinking about it. Um, yeah. I was just having a conversation with a friend last night because my great-grandfather in Dominica wrote his memoirs. Um, on the very first page of his memoir, um, he names, you know, my slave ancestor, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and that uh, enslaved person was given the name Jean, mm -hmm. French for John. Mm -hmm. um, and my cousin is the seventh or eighth or ninth john you know and so 
until I read that, I didn't understand that, you know, this, this enslaved name has been kept in our family. And my own middle name is Pearson. You know, people, most people think Pearson is a, a double barrel last name, but Pearson, right. Pearson is my middle name. And I am the sixth or seventh or eighth, you know, Pearson. And again, it's like, you can't get a more slave master name than Pearson, right? So these legacies are present with us. Um, and I'm, I'm really sort of interested and uh, curious to see how the collection is going to unpack some of that, that I think we need to do a little bit more confronting. Of. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And those, those voices are there, you know, yeah. those voices are definitely there. And I think yeah. the collection is, is going to allow us to listen to them, some of us for the first time almost. Mm -hmm. So. No, I, I totally agree. And I think uh, what you're saying is so uh, pertinent in terms of access to the collection. Um, there are donors who uh, and supporters who have insisted that this is not a collection that, you know, sits in the dark vault and then is just occasionally trotted out. This is a collection that must be used by scholars, historians, students, artists, you know, um, you know, as you say, uh, who want to have access to these histories, to their own histories, if they happen to be of Caribbean descent. Um, and yes, I totally agree. Um, that kind of visceral sense of, well, I mean, I've always been interested in images and, you know, visual culture um, and specifically photography. Um, it's, you know, this idea that the photograph tells the truth. You know, there is a truth so-called to the, uh, the, to the photograph. Um, and, but what are those truths that we are unpacking when we confront, you know, these images that are like immediately after, uh, you know, the medium is invented and uh, emancipation, you are seeing these, these photographs. So that's pe people, that means people were on the ground mm -hmm. documenting. Um, so there's such a kind of, closeness that's the only word that i can i can use um a closeness to this history that um you are afforded through these photographs that you don't get necessarily in you know some books that i'm sure we've both read like you know um clr james or you know the history of, of, of the caribbean um yes you get an understanding of the uh social political economic you know, um, uh, histories of the region, but when you, you have a, a photograph um, that you can identify as, you know, when I'm looking at the photographs from Barbados, you know, and I think, oh yes, this is, this is Barbados, you know, this is, so it was Barbados then, and it is Barbados more or less now, you know? <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, what does that mean? What does that mean about this legacy? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think um, I'm very uh, excited about the multiple ways that this collection uh, can and will be used. Yeah. Uh, and you mentioned scholars and historians. What has been the response um, from, from photography historians and scholars mm -hmm. in the Caribbean and the diaspora? You know, it has been um, overwhelming. Uh, when we made the announcement, um, I, you know, had requests for interviews, um, small, you know, um, national papers in Trinidad and in Barbados. And um, that was far more thrilling to me than uh, an interview in the star, not to denigrate the star, but, you know, just to have a kind of um, connection to uh -huh. the region with this, um, with the story, with this collection um, and their own um, exuberance, you know, uh, that this collection exists um, was, was frankly thrilling and to kind of, you know, uh, reconnect because I don't think we've always had those connections um, unless, you know, you happen to be in academia and you are, you know, uh, uh, involved in conferences or a kind of larger scholarly community. Um, this for a museum and for art historians to be connected 
in um, with our colleagues in the region, I think is is um, again amazing. You know, it's it's necessary yeah. um, because I and we learn from them as they learn from us, and it's this kind of constant, um, you know, uh, exchange rather than you know I'm telling you or you're telling you know it's and I think that that is what this. Um, uh, their enthusiasm, um, that's what has been brought out with this, with this collection. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's also making me think about, uh, you know, in the last decade or so, we've seen uh, a lot more attention paid to photography from the continent, African mm -hmm. photography, and yeah. a lot of scholarship and curatorial unpacking and mm -hmm. theorizing. Mm -hmm. um, and how do you see this collection participating in a larger conversation of photography? Um, and what are the relationships, are there relationships between that body of knowledge, work, theorizing around African photography? You know, that's such an interesting question um, because as you know, uh, African, the field of African photography is still fairly new and it's still oh. unfolding, really. Oh. Uh, I would say, you know, 10, 15 years um, at tops. Uh, people like Okwi and Wizor, who, you know, uh, pioneering a uh, curator, scholar, uh, putting uh, African, especially modernist African photography in, you know, the, the museum uh, setting like the Guggenheim uh, in the 90s. Um, so I think that, uh, and I'm still, and I have to kind of qualify, I am still, you know, learning, right? I am by no means uh, an expert uh, in, you know, Caribbean photography. African photography is really, you know, my, my field. Um, but I do see some parallels in that um, the medium is in the continent very early after it's, you know, um, invention or development um, as it is in in you know the Caribbean in Jamaica for, for instance um, the differences perhaps are you know the kind of plethora of um, anthropological mm -hmm. uh, ethnographic um, photographs that you see um, emerging from the continent as a result of, you know, colonization um, is a, li it's a little bit, um, I don't want to say different. Um, it's a different experience, perhaps, you know, um, because the histories are, are, are different uh, in a way. Um, so I don't know that I've seen the, the kind of, um, what's the word? Uh, blatant ethnographic, mm. you know, um, types uh, of photography coming out of the region thus far. But again, I'm still very early in, in this kind of research. Uh, but that doesn't say that the same kinds of type, you know, images are not also part of this history. You know, um, they're both this, this kind of early uh, 19th century uh, photography, uh, the majority of uh, uh, practitioners, photographers are European. Mm -hmm. They are coming with a uh, colonial gaze. Um, it is uh, an uneven power dynamic. Um, so very much the same um, kind of experience in uh, African or what I know of in, in uh, West African photography. Um, so, yeah, I, so I, I, in terms of the kind of scholarship um, and explosion, the way that we saw with African photography, I think it's still early to tell. I think mm -hmm. that there is a growing interest, especially in contemporary Caribbean photography. Uh, those um, photographers, both in the region and in, in the diaspora. Um, and who knows, maybe collections like uh, this uh, and other, you know, smaller collections will um, help to kind of galvanize that interest. You know, the more we kind of talk about it, um, as you know, there's going to be a um, Montgomery um, study day um, uh, on July 9th and 10th. Um, and that the purpose uh, for that is to kind of convene, you know, a group of scholars and historians and writers uh, um, to talk about, you know, the, um, the place of, of, of 
can be Toby now? And how does that uh, kind of um, move forward? You know, so I think it's a kind of developing uh, story um, mm -hmm. in terms of, of the field. Um, but I think it's also gaining um, a lot of interest and it'll be very interesting to, to watch how, how this all uh, unfolds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, the timing of the study days is, is part of why we're having this conversation now as mm -hmm. well, because, um, you know, we, uh, we had been planning to have a, a public conversation before mm -hmm. COVID, and this is just an attempt to be able to uh, make, make some of this content and work in progress um, accessible to, to a broader audience for sure. Mm -hmm. But I just want to go back to you, you, you were talk, talking about most of the photographers being European mm -hmm. and the colonial gaze, um, mm -hmm. and it's making me think of the experience of the the exhibition in the fall, last fall, at the Ryerson Image Center, The Way She Looks, you know, mm -hmm. created by Sandrine Collard, mm -hmm. which, um, you know, she sort of structured the exhibition uh, with uh, uh, a group of photographs, photographed, where people were photographed by European photographers, and then you move into another section of the exhibition where you have um, African folks photographed uh, by African photographers, mm -hmm. um, and then another section of really sort of contemporary self um, and other representation, um, and how you know we can't we can't free ourselves of these tensions mm -hmm. when we go into our archives, mm -hmm. um, and the seduction of the archive is that exactly that visceral ten, you know feeling that we were talking about and that excitement of mm -hmm. like seeing these images, yeah. but also um, the work that I imagine you have to take on as a curator to be able to contextualize um, these other issues that are present in the circumstances of how these photographs were taken, who Absolutely. took photographs, what actually are we looking at? Mm -hmm. um, and those uh, being able to uh, expand on um, those dynamics and mm -hmm. how, that, how that informs why those images may look the way that they look. It's a, a kind of burden that you have to take on that, you know, may not be present in other archives, you know. Mm -hmm. No, I think uh, it is, I think it's the most important part of my work um, that it is about a context. Mm -hmm. You know, you, uh, the photographs cannot live with by themselves. Mm -hmm. They have to be contextualized. If not, they are merely objects, aesthetic objects perhaps, um, but they, that's all they are. And the kinds of violent histories of trauma, violence, you know, um, we can go on uh, about, you know, the, the, the um, horrific history of transatlantic slavery in the Caribbean um, and the kind of, you know, afterlife or uh, connection <clears throat> in terms of these photographs to not address, you know, this, this, these histories and um, the violence of the, and continuing violence of um, the, that moment and uh, onward. Um, it would be, I don't even think the word is disingenuous. It, it just, you know, it, it, it would not make any sense mm -hmm. um, because they're, they are, it is embedded in the, uh, in the objects, in those photographs, those histories. Um, so it is incumbent on, on me to tell that story. The, the, the challenge is how to tell that story mm -hmm. because I think, um, yes, Obviously, this is the moment that these photographs are, um, are, are, you know, coming out of. But how do we kind of dig deeper and try, and for me, it's almost like a rescue mission. You know, how do we rescue um, and, and somehow detach the kind of colonial stamp yeah. on, you know, the, 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 the photographs and kind of rescue the objects you know, um, release the objectification and uh, encounter the subjects. Mm -hmm. You know, what are the, um, what are the narratives and the stories that we can recover? And again, this is not my, these are not my ideas. Again, the Sadia Hartman, you know, it's kind of, you know, the recovery of um, the, the kind of dispossessed. Um, and, I think that's the challenge because, uh, you know, often we don't know, we, sometimes we don't know the photographer. 
um, certain cabins of the setups uh, that are just kind of randomly or perhaps not so randomly, um, you know, documented, captured, you know, uh, through their lenses. Um, and then, you know, the kind of commodification of those objects um, circulating as postcards or, you know, um, in, um, uh, as uh, advertisements or um, in illustrated magazines. Um, so I think that for me is, you know, when I'm thinking about uh, an exhibition, when I'm thinking about how we engage uh, and write about these objects, but most importantly, how we get a public mm -hmm. in Toronto, in Canada, if this, if this uh, uh, exhibition travels in, you know, globally, how do we get that public who may not know you know, much about the, the Caribbean and its histories to understand that, you know, there are complex histories that we are talking about and that one cannot just take, again, this object on face value and, you know, try to, and, and think that you understand it. Yeah. Um, that this isn't about a kind of celebration of, um, you know, Caribbean peoples, um, that it is, more a kind of um, interrogation of, mm -hmm. of this moment. Um, and who is taking the photograph? Why are they taking it? Who, who is the subject? Um, what are the conditions that create, you know, this particular, we're talking about, I just talked about one photograph, <laughs> you know, when I've, when I've said all of that, imagine 4,000, yeah. you know, um, so, you know, it's, it, it is massive, but I think that um, one can't be overwhelmed by the kind of, you know, because massiveness, I guess, because there are so thousands and thousands and thousands of stories that are embedded in uh, this collection. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it's daunting, but I, I cannot be, I can't be overwhelmed because I think these are the stories that need to be, to be uncovered. And it's not, I am not going to be the only one telling those stories. Again, yeah. you know, I have a community of, of people that um, will assist in doing so. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you've mentioned the exhibition. So mm -hmm. the collection arrived at the EGU a year ago. Mm -hmm. Walk us through what has happened in the last year. Mm -hmm. and where are you going next? So um, pre-COVID, because um, we're still present in, in COVID, I guess, um, unfortunately, um, I had, uh, first of all, the collection had to be, I just talked about how massive it is. So, um, you know, indexed, cataloged, um, you know, uh, registered in our collections management, you know, system. Um, and that is ongoing uh, because, you know, there's so many kind of subcategories. We have albums and then within those albums, there are photographs and within those photographs, there are, you know, so it's really kind of um, unpeeling um, all of the, the various um, kind of categorizations uh, for the benefit of um, a kind of systematic, you know, um, cataloging. Um, and then uh, on occasion, um, I brought the collection out uh, for uh, visiting scholars, uh, students. Um, I had the great opportunity of um, presenting a small collection to uh, Professor Melanie Newton's class um, at U of T, the Caribbean Studies, Intro to the Caribbean Studies, um, uh, class and uh, it was so wonderful to get another kind of generations, yeah. uh, you know, um, uh, kind of response because they're, you know, kind of gen many generations now removed, born in Canada of Caribbean um, um, descent. Um, and, you know, it was the same kind of response. Oh my goodness, this, mm -hmm. you know, could be my grandmother and, oh, my parents were born in, you know, I don't know, Arima and this looks like, so it, it was very um, uh, heartening and gratifying. And it happens every time I pull out, mm -hmm. you know, to small selections uh, to people, um, to Caribbean people, because they automatically have this uh, kind of um, visceral response. So, um, so I've been pulling it out for those purposes um, and uh, also for research. 
you know, because the kind of end goal is the um, exhibition. Um, and so the uh, COVID pandemic has obviously stalled that research. Um, and, but it's, you know, I have to kind of figure out a way, we'll be back in the building, I think in September to kind of pick it up. Um, with the help of research assistants, um, as we begin to sift through and think about um, what this exhibition is, is going to, to look like, based on all of the things I've just spoken about in terms mm -hmm. of engagement with the public and uh, a recovery of, of um, uh, narratives and stories, um, you know, the kind of separating of the kind of colonial eye or gaze uh, and approach. So it's kind of a, a multi-pronged approach that I'm, I'm thinking about. And I think one of the reasons I wanted to sort of touch on that as well is mm -hmm. I don't know how many people understand what a curator does, mm -hmm. you know, and how much research is involved, you know, in putting together an exhibition. Um, and even the fact that you're holding these two study days um, to bring folks together, uh, to share their expertise, to speak to the issues, um, to inform us all, of, all the people who will participate, but also to really help you think through um, what, how you're going to put this exhibition together. So I know you don't want to give away too much, mm -hmm. but what, uh, right now, are there any mm -hmm. themes or ideas you can share with us that are sort of um, a direction that you're going in, in terms mm -hmm. of uh, working towards this August 2021 exhibition? Mm -hmm. um, that's a hard question, Michelle. Uh, Thank you, uh, give us a little, yes. I don't uh, slight. Um, yes. Um, I can say that what I want this exhibition to do is really um, bring all of the things that we've actually just spoken about. How okay. do we talk about the historical um, and the kind of modern and contemporary? And not only using photographs, I should say that yeah. um, a large portion of the exhibition, the way I'm thinking about it now, will be the Montgomery uh, photographs, of course. But I would like there to be a dialogue with other um, forms of expression in terms of, you know, artistic expression. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, painters, um, uh, video uh, installations, um, uh, contemporary photography, um, how, and, and these are Caribbean artists uh, in the diaspora. So Canada, uh, um, Britain, uh, the USA, um, how, what are modern and contemporary Caribbean artists, how are they um, thinking about those histories, um, talking back to those histories um, uh, through their various mediums. Great. So that's what I'm, I'm thinking, you know, so the very, the kind of um, minutia around, you know, the exact themes, etc. still a work in progress, um, but um, the, the pillars, these pillars that I'm thinking about really do correspond to what is being revealed in the collection um, about this kind of post-emancipation period. Um, and I'm using that as a kind of jumping off point for the modern and contemporary. And I'm hoping that, you know, there is this kind of, uh, you know, point counterpoint kind of um, uh, experience mm -hmm. that, uh, um, the audience or viewers will will have as they navigate uh, the exhibition. Love so I it. hope that wasn't too vague. Love it, love it. <laughs> so just before we close, I thought yes. we could just look at a few photos. Uh, sure. Some people, this might be their first chance to just see a little small, small sample of the collection. Sure, uh, let me share my screen. You so can what see we, that? Yeah. Yes. What are we looking at here? Uh, so this is uh, a photograph. I think it's just entitled Jamaican Women. <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, now, one of our uh, presenters, uh, Professor Steve Buckridge, has already said that some of the information, which is great, um, uh, in the archive um, is incorrect. So perhaps it's about date, uh, um, which is, so I'm, again, this Montgomery st uh, collection, uh, study day will be so beneficial to mm -hmm. make these kinds of corrections through, you know, uh, the experts. 
the experts. Um, so yeah, so this is a group of, of women um, in Jamaica. Um, I think it's late 19th, early 20th, but probably more uh, late 19th uh, century. Um, and, you know, it's just this variety of of Jamaican women, you know, almost exemplifying, you know, the Jamaican motto out of many one people. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, it's one of my uh, favorite uh, photographs in in the collection. They wear um, so much clothes. <laughs> I don't it's so hot. <laughs> and you are, and I, you know, I, and Steve, Professor Buckovich is a specialist on uh, Caribbean dress styles yes. from this, you know, um, moment. So I'm so excited to hear what he's going to say about uh, this, you know, um, long, long sleeve gingham. I don't know what it, what it, what it is. Um, uh, you know, the, the material, the, uh, the styles, some of which are, of course, coming straight from, you know, Europe. Um, Absolutely. But, I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm a dandy, as you know, so yes. mm -hmm. the clothes, but A, I, the woman in the middle, it's like, I, you know, we have a family photo of my great grandmother and it's like, you know, she's dressed like that. Mm -hmm. um, but then also the primary school I went to, our uniforms were gingham. Gingham, of course. Yeah. So the presence of gingham in school children's uniforms throughout the Caribbean, it's like, that's what I'm thinking about when I... Absolutely. Absolutely. And then of course, the kind of you know, the head tie, which, you know, you, it presents itself both, you know, in Jamaica, but also in Martinique and Guadeloupe, you know, um, so how, yeah. what are these kinds of um, creolized, yes. you know, identities uh, or identity formations seen through um, what people are wearing? I think it's, it's, it's one of the most fascinating um, aspects of the, of the collection for me. Mm -hmm. Oops. Okay. Um, so I, we talked about uh, the kind of shift in economies uh, post uh, emancipation. Um, so these are cocoa pods. Uh, I think this is also Jamaica. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so yeah, you know, another um, uh, one of many uh, photographs of, again, this kind of labor, but also what's interesting to me is it's staged. Right, it's a very right. staged uh, yeah. photograph. You know, the the uh, photographer definitely. You know, those cocoa pods look so perfectly. You know, um, uh, kind of assembled, mm -hmm. um, and also their um, their the, the way they've been posed. Yeah, right? and I think that's that's a really important thing to 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 bring attention to because particularly, you know, I'm a documentarian and I mm -hmm. teach in a documentary program. Um, and photographers have always staged photographs mm -hmm. and documentary, one of these myths, you know, is that documentary is like this fly on the wall and just captures real life. Um, and that only when Photoshop came along, people started, you know, manipulation and, you know, photographers have been <laughs> manipulating and staging and tweaking uh, mm -hmm. forever composition yeah. and, and for, for many reasons. So. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I mean, when I first saw these photographs in Patrick's loft, I, I think I was, I was squealing. Um, and then I had to stop myself as I got to know more about these, uh, uh, these studio photographs, because as you said, these are also staged. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Felix Morin is a, um, for what we know about him, from what we know about him, a French um, photographer uh, is in Trinidad by the 1890s. Um, and there is a whole um, series of um, these kind of stage studio photographs of Hindu women. Mm -hmm. And so these are the, you know, women um, that are part of that um, indentured, you know, uh, labor force um, in the, in Trinidad, in Guyana, um, uh, in parts of Jamaica. But, you know, what's fascinating, I mean, this is, they're just glamorous portraits. You know, the way he's lit, uh, the, the lighting and the, you know, the, the kind of, um, you know, the bejeweled. Um, yeah, the bangles. Bangles, exactly. And the, the, the coins and um, which kind of reflects, a, you know, I've, I've arrived, I've, you know, I'm, I'm doing very well for myself, you yeah. know, but that probably wasn't the case. 
um, we don't see, I should say, we do see the kind of lived experience of uh, Hindu women, you know, in, in Trinidad, in Jamaica, which uh, they don't look like this. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's that kind of tension of the the kind of, um, you know, staged uh, studio photograph of which uh, Felix Marin, um, you know, really does uh, produce a lot of them. Yeah. But at the same time, like, you know, this is what I mean about the seduction of the archive. And I, mm -hmm. and I saw this in, you know, many of the sort of didactic panels that Sandrine used in her exhibition at the mm -hmm. Rick. Um, and as staged as it is and, you know, consent is out of the window and all mm -hmm. of those things. But then when you really spend time with this woman's facial expression, it's like you love it, mm -hmm. right? She is, mm -hmm. you know, it's like within all of that, she is maintaining and owning something. Mm -hmm. You may not be able to put your finger on what that is. Right. You can, you know, she's a right. voice, voice is there. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, uh, I guess, what Barth calls the punctum, perhaps, the, you know, that, that <laughs> moment. <laughs> Let's move, on, let's move on. Let's move on. <laughs> we we can have that conversation off. Yeah, that's another, yes. another <laughs> um, So I talked about the um, this notion of the tropics as idyllic, you know, um, setting it up uh, in this case as you know the the new Mediterranean. Um, uh, so this is uh, Castleton Gardens uh, in Jamaica. Uh, so there are many uh, photographs of uh, these lush uh, gardens where, um, you know, the colonial administration um, and other folks would kind of gather and kind of be reminiscent of the gardens in, in Europe, you know, in Britain, uh, et cetera. So they made uh, for interesting backdrops to uh, many of these uh, photographs, again, to kind of bring home that um, notion of the, of the tourist, you know, uh, photographs uh, that we see repeated over and over again, you know, um, you know, even now, you know, yeah. um, so. Um, and this is, this is Felix Morin again. And so a shift from the kind of uh, uh, studio photographs with uh, people uh, as mm -hmm. subjects, and now the kind of flora and fauna of, of the region. Again, exoticizing, you know, the, the kind of produce uh, with the grapefruit, uh, breadfruit uh, tree. Um, and I think this is a soursop, yeah, uh, soursop uh, fruit. Um, and I have a friend, a colleague who has eroticized this particular uh, photograph. Uh, she's convinced that that's what Maureen was doing, mm. uh, that this is a kind of phallic, you know, uh, symbol. Anyway, um, uh, again, a conversation for another time, but there's so there is a lot to kind of um, unpack in uh, in these photographs as, as well. Mm -hmm. And certainly, I mean, contemporary, there's the last few years, we've seen a lot of taking up of flora and mm -hmm. fauna in contemporary photography mm -hmm. and thinking about Ebony Patterson's Ebony, work, for you know, sure, um, for and sure. many other photographers. I think about Nadia Huggins' photography. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. Um, and so, uh, interesting conversation across time. There. Right. Yeah. Well, and that is exactly what the exhibition is going yep. to do. So, <laughs> hint, hint. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a good place to close, I guess. Yeah. Um, I really want to thank you for, for sharing so much of your knowledge and expertise with us. Um, you know, I think for me, one of the personal tensions with a collection like this is where does it get housed? You know, it's not, it's not housed in the Caribbean, it's housed here, uh, you know, in a North American city. Um, but I feel like Toronto, you know, our diaspora is present, as you, you mentioned, Brooklyn, it could have gone to Britain. Um, I think that we are, I don't know, six to seven percent of the population, but I feel like for a major North American city, the Caribbean population here has also inf has influenced and put its stamp on a mainstream Toronto culture as well. You know, there's a Caribbeanness to this city that I think is different to other large North American cities. Um, I mean, you could get a roti in downtown Toronto. You can't get a roti in Manhattan. You know, you gotta go to Brooklyn or Queens for that. You know, so in some ways. Um, uh, it, it really makes sense to me that this collection is here and I know that you are working 
as hard as possible, as you said, access for scholars um, and historians and publics everywhere and not just publics here. Um, and so on behalf of, uh, I feel like I am part of those multiple audiences as an artist, as a scholar, as a Trinidadian, as an art lover myself. And so on behalf of all of us, I really wanna thank you for your stewardship and your care. I know working in a large institution is not easy. Um, I know working in a large institution as a black woman is not easy. I know working in a large institution where you are bringing black artists through the doors is not easy. And we see you and we appreciate that labor and that care and that storytelling. And so I, I just wanna thank you on behalf of, of, of the audiences that uh, I feel are watching this right now and feeling very similarly. So. Oh, thank you, Michelle. I, I appreciate it. And again, as I started out by saying, uh, the support is um, unending and uh, it is important, as you say, for us who are in the institution, um, the unicorns, the, the onlys, um, the one ofs who are trying to get others actually in, because I think that's it's important to not just be the the uh, only. Um, but yeah, that notion of care, I think, is, is really um, important. Care for, caring for uh, a collection, um, but also who is using it and how it's being used and, and opening it up as, as much as possible. Um, I, I think that's the definition of access. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful that you uh, gave me this opportunity to talk more about the collection. Okay. All right. Thanks for watching, everybody. And uh, August 2021, stay tuned. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye.